Uh, my name is Misha and I'm the manager of City Studio and this year or this semester we're doing our Hubbub online. We've had 17 projects run in this winter semester. And obviously this event was scheduled to be in person at Innovation Works um, at our social in London's social innovation co-working community space. So this is our first time hosting this event online and we've done our best to create this opportunity to bring everybody together so that we can review the projects and learn more about what you've what you've been working on through the, this last semester. So just before we started, I wanted to thank um, our working group uh, and our advisory circle as well as our volunteers, Kayan. Madison, uh, Aishwarya, and Lukshan, Lukshanan. Thank you. And um, I'm going to go through the institutions. And if you can just do your jazz hands when you're when you're when I name your institution. So everyone from Pillar Nonprofit Network, please do your jazz hands. <laughs> and everyone from the City of London, please do your jazz hands. <laughs> And everyone from Brescia University College, please do your jazz hands. And everyone from Fanshawe College, please do your jazz hands. Fanshawe, she's <laughs> <laughs> And Everyone from um, Huron University College, please do your jazz hands. And everyone from King's University College, do your jazz hands. And everyone from Western University, please do your jazz hands. I think um, the main thing I wanted to talk about is that uh, we've launched our Project Showcase Hubbub page on the website. So you will notice on the City Studio London website, if you go to the projects page, um, that you'll see uh, the landing page for all of the Hubbub projects that we'll, we'll work on today, that we'll be talking about today. And so I'm just wanting, I'm gonna show you video here on the start of on the top of that screen so city studio is an innovation hub that brings together students faculty and city staff to prototype and launch real projects in our city to real challenges this is the way forward this is the, the experiential learning that students are looking for this is an opportunity to get your hands dirty and students are asking for this and we're making it happen for them so after preparing and developing the project course matches with city staff and faculty, the city staff meet the students in the classroom. And then they work through the semester together to, to create solutions to city challenges. And they present these solutions at Hubbub in December and in April. Covering housing, environmental sustainability, climate change, uh, business improvements, community diversity and inclusion, all different departments of the city. It's really taking out uh, research ideas, project ideas from the lab out into the public and actually making a direct impact onto the city. And so this is an absolutely fantastic opportunity. This is taking what we teach our students in the classroom and it's getting out into the street and putting it into action. And they're working with the organizations in the community on, on issues and problems and opportunities that are really important to the community. It's not abstract, it's because we want to give the city the best possible product. So it changes the stakes. And it elevates it to the whole city to say that we are working together, we're bringing students together, they get to see what students in other institutions are doing, the institutions are talking at the same table, that is magic build relationships and to build bridges with one another only helps us towards a more sustainable future. So um, just a little reminder, we're going to have a special guest. The mayor is going to hop on and join us um, probably about midway through our, our time and, and give some remarks. He's been following our work closely um, and he's got a meeting at the moment. So he's going to join us. And when he does, he'll give us some remarks there. So we will have a little interruption um, at some point during our projects, but I'll guide us through that. So. Um, just also, uh, I think you would have noticed that we had these kind of graphic recordings um, in our on display at the last hubbub and we have an, a really talented artist that we work with named emma richard and emma can you unmute yourself for a second and, and just say hi hello great 
Um, so we'll have Emma come at the end and she's taking some graphic recording of our session today and at the end she'll come back and show us, she'll reflect back to us sort of a witness, witnessing in graphic. There you can see her at the bottom of, of my screen there. She's working away in the background. So we're going to start off with um, a really neat project. Let's see. So it's called the City of London Open Data Portal Improvement and I saw that we have um, we have the faculty, Lindsay Rivard, on the call with us. Lindsay, did you want to speak at all about the project for a minute? Uh, sure, yeah. So, um, hi, everyone. My name is Lindsay Rivard. Um, I'm faculty at Fanshawe College in the School of Language and Liberal Studies. And um, in our class in Search and Evaluation Program, we've been really excited to work on the Open Data Portal Improvement Project. So the City of London has an Open Data Portal that anyone can go on to and um, check out the open data sets that they have available to uh, to the public and uh, the city of london wanted some feedback on basically the user experience of the open data portal so uh you know do people have any success stories with open data portal um, are there any specific improvements that uh, users of the open data portal are looking for so we launched a survey with our class our class worked really hard on um, putting a survey together and it's actually up until uh, tomorrow so if anyone's interested in taking that survey uh, you're you're free to do that it's on the get involved um, London website and uh, yeah hopefully we'll have some some data to work with shortly and I know the students are excited to get their hands on that great thank you Lindsay mm -hmm. And I'll just show you, so briefly, we're starting to understand the, the um, architecture of this website. So each project has its own project page. And you'll see here that we have the, um, the project kind of poster with all the descriptions of what the project is, um, why it's needed, how it works. Um, here you'll also find information about the project itself, the students, um, what part of the city's strategic plan this uh, project was addressing. So here we can see that it was part of leading in the public service. We can see all the way down to the action that was was accomplished through this project. There's also a project video here that's great and it's about uh, a minute and a half long and I would suggest you all take a look at that as well. And as Lindsay said, the project is, or sorry, the survey is online. I see that I, we haven't put a link to the survey, but um, I think actually the survey link is on the poster here, so you can find the survey link that way to, to find more information about that. Sorry, did you have something you wanted to add there? Link is here, but it's not activated. It's where, under the project description. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, but it's not uh, activated. You can just copy and paste it. Sure. Okay, thank you for that. <laughs> okay. So next, we are going to look at project um, from King's University. This project was addressing um, a common waste bylaw uh, infraction that was happening in student neighborhoods where um, the adherence to the waste bylaw was not always being met. And there were some complications around um, how the how the kind of enforcement of that bylaw was working and how it wasn't very effective because the people who were living in the houses weren't actually the owners of the, pro the houses for the most part. So um, sometimes the communication was lost. So this project was working to address that. And so here you can see kind of a description about the project. Uh, you can also find out all the information. There's a bunch of project presentation files here that you can take a look at. So we have actually the links to the different student presentations. And I'll just show one of those now. Besides what you have already mentioned, um, from the start, the students at King's were really keen to come to actionable solutions, kind of uh, seeing things happen on the ground. But since the closure of the universities, everything has kind of been stalled. And I've been encouraging students to recognize that a lot of their work just continues on especially with the public presentations of their ideas we were uh, keen to open a free store at king's on campus to bring together all of the sustainability 
uh, initiatives in the neighborhood and on campus. So students came up with the idea of opening the free store on campus to have this central location where community members and King's uh, members could repurpose, reuse, and recycle materials. So coming to a solution as to why is there so much excessive waste at the end of the academic year, um, the free store seemed to be a really great solution. But since uh, the closure of the university, that pilot project has kind of stalled, but we're working. Um, students are still keen in September to continue on, and it seems like they're really keen to continue into the future with the project, so the project has longevity. Thank you very much. Yeah, and so the students um, carried out some working groups, and I can show you. This was some of their, their data collection. And as we said, the, you can, there's audio on these files. So if you have a look at them, you can also listen to the, the student presentation. I'll try to show you some of that Unique now. Positions of student influences material waste practices. The experiences and perceptions of students living in student houses differs from non-students in regards to material waste. Household tensions, neighborhood cleanliness, and convenience are influenced by the unique circumstances and dynamics of student life. Here we have two key quotes that were said by individuals in our focus groups. Last year, like my last exam, was on the last day of the schedule, so it was late. And then the moving day was the, the day after my last exam. So it's just go, go, go. And everyone's parents came so early just to move everything. And it's just a lot of garbage because we were so quick to move. I feel like I'm actually a really clean person, but I find because when you look at other people, all your schedules are different. It's so hard to get together and clean at one time and make everything good and then keep it. Because when your schedules are so off, it's makes it really hard. I personally found this section, this key finding to be one of the most important when it came to our dominant themes, as it seemed like most of our, many of our codes were able to fit under student culture and it seemed the most unique and present in both groups. Great. So yeah, so there's more, there's three presentations like that if you want to uh, dig deeper into that, to that work. There's a lot of data, yes. So next we're going to have a look at a project about um, NIMBYism. So not in my backyard. And um, this project was brought forward by uh, the Parks Department and was trying to understand um, how to best engage the public around um, some of these new projects that were being actually developed largely through um, public um, interest, but then when it was coming time to execute them in the locations, there would be some local resistance. So uh, Kate Graham's class at Huron was working on doing carrying out case studies for the city uh, across different projects um, across Canada. Uh, and so there's a document here that you can dive into that's uh, all of the case studies that the students carried out. And I think we had Trevor and Josh from the class who wanted to speak a little bit about that. Are you guys on the, the call today? If you are, you can unmute yourself to, to share about your project. Hey. Hi. Trevor here. I hope, uh, hope Josh, Josh found his way to the line, but um, thank you so much for having us. And we're really happy to be here to uh, represent the class. We really enjoyed doing this exercise. Uh, speaking on behalf of everyone. Uh, I know when we all came together last week to present and discuss, uh, everyone was really excited to um, talk about their projects. And I think we all believe we found the solution to NIMBYism uh, in cities everywhere. Uh, so personally, I focused on the issue of high-speed rail uh, as this came up for uh, London, Ontario in the last election cycle. Um, and the rural response that was successful in uh, changing transit policy for southwestern Ontario. Uh, and so jumped up at the opportunity to speak on here. Uh, if, if Mr. Holder is online, I just thought, you know, from my project, maybe have some tips for him on how we can get high speed rail to London, Ontario. Uh, so 
I think one of the biggest conclusions was that London as a city uh, probably now needs to start to take a leadership role uh, in the in the region in coordinating transit policy rather than uh, letting some of these smaller communities become well organized and highly vocal opposition groups because that's ultimately what they did and so I see a space for the city of London to uh, try to step up and become like the leader in uh, southwestern transit policy uh, because if they if they don't take on this role uh, then other groups that have um, much smaller demographics will become well organized and try to uh, take over the policy process for um, transit policy in southwestern Ontario. So what London can do as the leader is become the coordinator of developing a comprehensive transit plan uh, that is inclusive of these rural communities and is completely um, caters to their concerns uh, and brings them into dialogue while prioritizing the needs of, of London people. So if the answer is high-speed rail, I, I personally won't take a stance on that, uh, but if the answer is high-speed rail, uh, then as a leader, London can be advocating for that and design a plan that caters to their rural communities uh, that includes high-speed rail in the plan. So we'll start with high-speed rail and then we'll go and say, what do the townships of like St. Mary's, Stratford, Woodstock need to buy into this kind of plan? And that probably means strong connectivity to uh, the city centers of either London, Kitchener or Hamilton. Uh, so that these rural communities feel like they can access the urban transit systems and are not being left out and ignored uh, along the way. So that's my message to Mr. Holder. I think Mr. Holder can take a leadership role, can be the, the chief policy planner for transit in southwestern Ontario, uh, and he can bring, bring the rural communities along with uh, whatever the needs of London are. So thank you. Okay, so next we were going to the community diversity and inclusion strategy. Um, hi everyone, I'm just going to quickly talk about what we, how this project started. So uh, right now the community diversity and inclusion strategy is in the process of implementing um, all of our strategies that are within the strategy. Um, so we engaged Patrick's class to kind of get us started on this journey and do some background research and um, propose some strategies or actions that we can take to implement the strategy. So I'll just let Patrick talk about the project. Okay, thanks Kinga. Um, so I'm from the School for Advanced Studies in the Arts and Humanities at Western, which is a program that's uh, really emphasizes interdisciplinary learning and I won't get into promoting our program but I'll just say that the first term of, of the year we involved our fourth year students in a project with local artist Jamili Hassan and it really helped the students do some some work around what we might think of as alternative and forgotten histories of London that really emphasize diversity and inclusion. So then the opportunity to work with um, City Studio and the CDIS priority groups was a great follow-up. Um, there were 20 students in the class, and you can see in the poster that the five priorities, which, which you could say fundamentally represent reconciliation, anti-racism, uh, connecting Londoners to diversity and inclusion, uh, removing accessibility barriers, uh, removing barriers to accessibility and employment. Those are the five kind of themes. And so the students in five groups worked with the priority city oriented priority groups at their meetings. They had meetings in January and then March, although in some cases the students weren't able to attend the March meeting. And the kinds of outcomes they were working towards were a combination of research for the priority group, given that this whole project has really been just launched as of the fall of 2019. So they were emphasizing research for the priority group and then helping develop tools for promotion and measuring impact. And of course, it's early days, but the great opportunity for the students was actually working with, with city people, including from the from City of London, but also others really committed to these priorities. Um, 
we had intended to have a conference at which they were going to be presenting the projects they did with Jamili Hassan, as well as the projects they did with City Studio. Those are now going to go online. And fundamentally, I would say that the kinds of things they were focusing on really on behalf of the priority groups were assessment, critique, promotion and communication regarding the various ways that these priorities are being mobilized within the city. Last thing to say is just thanks to Kinga and Michelle Delamora and Misha. Um, I think this was a very hands-on kind of project and in essence the students really had to be adaptive in terms of, of trying to produce some value and so I think it was a tremendous learning opportunity that did twin well with what they had done with Jamili. So thank you. Yeah, now we're going to talk about a project that Brescia was working on um, that was looking at recycling in parks with uh, Parks and Paths. Uh, students found this to be a very enjoyable um, pursuit. Um, I think what they were aiming to do is was uh, pictured in the subtitle, A Walk in the Park, uh, to make the walk in the park as nice as possible and to speak to decision makers in London that uh, that London does benefit uh, from its uh, gorgeous parks and that uh, one way to make it uh, even more attractive is to have a recycling program uh, for the parks. And this is mostly what the students did. They also looked at some background, the government of Ontario's position on recycling and London's past experience with recycling. But the focus was on trying to find the best practices uh, for uh, introducing recycling uh, in, the, in the parks. Um, we found there wasn't a lot of data on this. As a result, we had to borrow from other experiences, which led students to suggest that perhaps the best uh, way to begin with this analysis is to have some pilot projects uh, which would uh, test a few ideas. Some of those ideas uh, for recycling in the park included uh, keeping it as simple as possible. It was fun uh, looking at all the decision making models which were used uh, to, uh, to analyze these things by various researchers and we found out that uh, usually the best uh, strategy was to, to, to realize that people were leading busy lives and that it better be simple and to the point. Uh, as a result, the students' um, presentations in terms of uh, options uh, were straightforward. Uh, one was simply having a one stream bin. One stream simply means a bin for all recycling, not dividing it up into paper and, uh, and, and other items. Um, as well, we found out that, um, that recycling sometimes is, uh, is lost. Uh, it does not uh, succeed as well because people with, uh, with their love of dogs who sometimes um, contaminate um, recycling bins. So what we suggested the students did is if you're going to go move forward with the recycling bins as well, try to complement that with a bin for, um, for dog uh, waste. Um, students also uh, were intrigued by the information technology that can be used perhaps to further the, the cause of recycling in the parks. So there are a number of items that, uh, that they put forward. And in the presentation, uh, they simply said that uh, look into this. Um, another one, which is not included in the in the um, in the brochure or in the in the poster, but one which we all found kind of interesting, was that recycling programs often work if people know that other people care about recycling. So a study in Norway showed that. Um, Recycling is very popular and successful because there's simply a note to, above the recycling bin saying that people care about recycling and engage in recycling. We tend to be uh, creatures that are herd like. We like to do what other people are doing. So uh, I found that particularly intriguing. Some of you may have run into um, a kind of approach to decision making called nudge. And nudge is the idea that people take shortcuts when making decisions and that we should try to exploit the sort of the positive uh, side of that. And uh, in terms of, uh, of recycling, it might be that uh, I'll do whatever other people are doing. So if you simply put a, I'm being a little bit facetious, but perhaps not, uh, simply a marker above a recycling bin saying that people care about recycling, that may have the desired effect of people taking more seriously recycling. So in all in all, we enjoyed it. We, we did some other stuff as well. We had a large class, so they looked at uh, the policy of, uh, of the government of Ontario and what London's been doing in the past. But the focus was on trying to address the issue which we're assigned, which is to find some ideas for recycling in the park to make the walk in the park. So the next project we were gonna look at is 
uh, Jeanette Como and Jennifer Smith were working um, on uh, child literacy. I just want to thank everybody for the opportunity to do this virtually today and for you know, the opportunity for students to share the really important work that they've done this term. Um, it was a really, it was a really exciting term. I really enjoyed the experience of my students and I want to thank Jennifer in particular um, for her ongoing and continued support um, as we come to the end of the term. So this was really, uh, in our class, like every other class, was a student-led um, initiative right from start to finish. So I'd like to invite Gabrielle Grimes uh, to please give the summary for our class. Yeah, hey, I hope everyone can hear me. Thank you, Jeanette. Um, so my name is Gabby and I'll be briefly summarizing the project our Building Healthy Communities class has been working on all this semester. Uh, to give a little background, our class partnered with City Studio and Child and Youth Network of London to assess the feasibility of engaging healthcare providers in a strategy that would increase the low literacy rates in our community. So after engaging with community leaders and doing our own research, we as a class recognize that an a l increase in literacy rates would lead to an increase in children's health and overall well-being, therefore making literacy a social determinant of health. After collective brainstorming, the class separated into several different groups and began to develop the strategy. We covered several different avenues, such as assessing the needs of children uh, through a community profile to identify high-risk neighborhoods in London, performing an environmental scan of available resources in these neighborhoods, conducting an empirical evaluation of family level characteristics such as income and parental education associated with children's literacy development, consulting with families, healthcare providers, and community leaders, and lastly, evaluating the policy and healthcare context relevant to literacy and child development. Upon the completion of all these components, we came together to develop a literacy movement that would best suit London. It will involve a co-op education program that engages high school and university students with London's family learning centers to deliver literacy-rich resources and programming. Over time, this co-op program could be scaled up to include the Middlesex London Health Unit. For those who are interested, our report will be available in the upcoming weeks and we look forward to sharing it with everyone. Thank you so much and I hope you enjoy our poster. Thanks for sharing, Gabby. And yeah, as you can see, there's a there's poster there. Um, there's there's another poster as well, so there's some more information there. And um, we'll add that report here as well uh, once we have that here. So you can check back in on that project for more information about that. I think what City of Studio has done uh, in uh, these two semesters has been nothing short of phenomenal. And I say that, uh, you know, when I think about the 400 plus students that have been involved with the great cooperation that we've had uh, with so many organizations, certainly our post-secondary uh, uh, universities and Fanshawe, you folks have been tremendous. And in addition to that pillar, of course, and our own city staff. Uh, you know, it's funny. I was thinking of the, I was thinking of the projects that you've undertaken, and uh, and I, I think they're so uh, so important today. When we look at some of the issues around uh, women's safety and issues around parks and paths and uh, what you're about to get into in terms of the uh, Goodwill's neighborhood revitalization. But you know, there was an interesting project that I also thought very timely in light of what we're all dealing with today. And that was looking at the city planning department's resiliency uh, strategy. And I thought it was really compelling because it, it's kind of the what if scenario. What if there is, uh, if the economy collapses, which we're certainly not suggesting that might happen. What happens if there's a flood? What happens if we can't respond to the kinds of things that we would do in a normal economic environment? And look where we are today. We are in a situation where everyone is, uh, is coping, uh, doing their best. But I think this project amongst the many that uh, have been undertaken by the students really speaks to issues that are current today and matter today in our city. And so to me, what makes this valuable is not just the kind of work and the training and focus on issues that matter to the city. I think the other part that strikes me that is absolutely important is where we go from here. Where do we take the ideas that have been generated and some of the solutions around these uh, items and, 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 and make them meaningful and things that we can act on? Uh, I look forward to actually that accountability component where we take the hard work that people have done and, and see if we can uh, uh, bring those to life in a sense that, that, we, bring, uh, that we bring value to, uh, to the, and, and respect to the folks who have done the kind of work that they have to, uh, to bring that out. 
So what I would love to provide is some accountability back through you. And from my standpoint, my accountability is, is that as we review these projects, I'd love us to dialogue again. So that as you look at your next cohort and the projects that you undertake, that you look at those things and then um, you'll say, you know what, what we did mattered. The things that we do today have had a substantive impact on our city. So am I allowed to say thank you? Thanks to everybody that's been involved in this. You've been tremendous. I am so grateful that you would uh, take not only the projects, but engage some of the smartest minds in our city, uh, some of the smartest minds that we intend to keep in our city as well. So thank you for this. I'd like to thank uh, City Studio London for the innovation of doing this at all, and then at the same time, engaging uh, not only the mentors and the facilitators of this group, but the students as well. I'm proud of all of you. And Pillar, by the way, just thanks for being Pillar. What you do is great too. Thank you very much, Mayor. We really appreciate you joining us today and uh, really appreciate your continued support. Okay, so we were talking about uh, the Goodwill Industries Neighborhood Revitalization Planning Visualization. So this was a project from Fanshawe where um, graphic design, or sorry, um, urban planning students were, were working on 3D visualizations um, and urban planning. And so we have four really cool projects here that are looking at this intersection of Horton and Wellington Street. This project was looking at um, adding some green space, adding some green walk path, walkways, connecting with the BRT rapid transit system. They also have some demographics about uh, residents in the area and businesses in the area. We have another project here that was looking at adding some of some um, sustainability features. So green roofs, bioretention garden beds and permeable surfaces. And you can look through some of their, their goals and objectives here on the, on the side of their screen here. They're looking at ensuring that the site will be deemed accessible to all regardless of the method of mobility due to the abundance of paths and proximity to BRT stops. But obviously also this is a pretty greened project you can see here on the site map. Lots of green space, lots of uh, retention of the, some of the historic features of the site. So there were these um, original houses on the site that they've decided to re retain and duplicate into these townhouses to create this sort of historic facade, but obviously alluding to some newer features in the background here, this really impressive design feature that's kind of exciting with lots of terraced roof space and green roofs and um, yeah, just a really dynamic design here. We have another project here that's also done lots of work on understanding what, what are all the different features of that location, what are some of the demographics of the population, 3,600 residents, the median household income is about $33,000 annually, and here you can see the design that they're proposing. So they have a mixed use town, tower, three uh, mixed use towers comprised of retail at street level, affordable residential units, offices and event spaces um, that accommodate ease of pedestrian use throughout the site. So you can see lots of different really attractive features and how they've also incorporated kind of this, the rapid transit um, lines that are, that are programmed for this site. So those are some exciting projects to have a look at. And again, just a reminder, we're up in the projects section of the website. Next, we're going to look at, so this anti-discrimination mm -hmm. bystander intervention toolkit. This was a really interesting project where we had two classes that actually worked together. So we had a, a psychology class and a social theater class that worked together through the year to um, harvest research and then create different interventions based on the research um, around uh, anti-discrimination toolkits. So you can read more about um, their different interventions. This, this, the project has a website you can go and visit for more information there, where they also have posted, if you go to the City Studio Performance Archive page, they have all their posters and they also have audio walks for each of the, the posters. So what they were looking at was different forms of uh, discrimination. Um, so the isms, whether it's racism, sexism. Um, so we have physical ableism, sanism, racism, 
and xenophobia in London. And they each have a different intervention that's been recorded by the theater students, the social theater students that you can, you can take their, you can actually go on their adventure of their, that they're proposing. And so, uh, yeah, you can see you have the audio walks here and the posters and we'll just play. This is a one minute video of, a, of one of the interventions. Take a seat. You smile at them, but they see you're wearing headphones so they don't bother trying to talk to you. They're too busy for you anyways. In order not to seem weird, just sitting here, look out a window, or at a painting, or at whatever else is in your living room. Your friends, or your family, are sitting right here with you, or they have been at some point. But are they really with you? They are here. You're here. A wall stands between you, an invisible wall protruding from your chest, the cement weighing you down with each breath you take. They're here, but you are not. So that's just an example of one of the audio, the guided audio walks that is the students have created. And that's a student who's um, listening to one of those audio walks. So I'd encourage you to check that out. And that research came through a number of focus groups. Um, it's through the community diversity and inclusion strategy of the city. Next, we're gonna look at London's workplace diversity and inclusion strategy. Here you can read more about the project and we have a video from the students of their presentation that I'll share now. My name is Mykeleen Fala, and I'm currently a fourth year student at King's University College. I'm doing an honors double major in Thanatology and Disability Studies with a certificate in Lost Grief and Bereavement Studies. I participated in City Studio through Disability Studies 3311, Changing Context and Practices. In this course, we looked at ways to analyze policy through a disability studies perspective. Disability studies is an interdisciplinary study, which means that it's cut across traditional disciplinary divides, and as a result, a range of people from different disciplines have made key contributions from psychology and education, for example. Disability is seen as a social issue. The problem of disability is in terms of barriers in the social world and not problems within the individual only. The project I worked on was the City of London's accommodation of employees with disabilities policy. This policy provides definition of disability and the procedures for employees to be given accommodation. The procedures state that the city is obligated to provide accommodations for disabled employees unless the accommodation would result in undue hardship. This policy works in, con in conjunction with other policies, such as the Ontario Human Rights Code, as it allows employees to receive accommodations and provides the guidelines on how to do it appropriately. A key finding of our analysis was that this policy medicalizes disability, meaning that the emphasis is placed on individual medical uh, conditions. A negative consequence of this approach is that people who don't have diagnosis may experience challenges in the workplace but won't be eligible for supports. Also, it puts the responsibility on individuals to seek out supports. In disability studies, we learn about universal design, which is defined as the which is defined as the design of products and environments that can be used and experienced by people of all ages and abilities to the greatest extent possible without adaptation. Applied to a workplace policy context, employers can be encouraged to reduce the need for accommodations by incorporating the principles of universal design in their policies and work environments. In our view, access to work is not an option, it is a human right. We hope our analysis can help to shed light on possibilities to support disabled employees in London. 
we recommend that employers incorporate universal design principles as it focuses on changing the environment for everyone, not just people with visible or known disabilities. This is especially important in employment contexts, where simple changes to the workplace culture can reduce the need to, to accommodate for invisible disabilities, such as mental health conditions. When universal design principles are applied, the focus is not on the individual, but on the workplace environment. As a result, everyone has the ability to utilize the environment in an easy, accessible, and equitable way. Thank you. So there's, yeah, there's lots more information on the posters there of the students' work. Next, we're going to go to the results, which was what the mayor mentioned in some of his remarks. So this was a project done with the engineering students at Western, um, and they are actually working on this through their graduate uh, master's dissertation. So um, these posters are their first kind of findings of their, of their research, and we'll have more coming in through the summer. Um, this project is looking at urban flooding and um, comes up here. Okay. So they're developing some machine learning uh, modeling of urban flooding um, to be able to predict some of the implications, especially around climate change and climate, climate adaptation, um, to be able to create some resiliency strategy based on some real data of the city and how urban flooding will be impacted in the city through the coming years. We also have another one on, so there's another project on urban flooding that's actually being developed based on research out of Toronto and applying, sort of creating the model to be able to apply to London setting as well. And then finally, we have a project on the urban heat island effect. Um, similarly, creating models so that we can run some different analysis in London of what are some of the different risks that we have in London. Uh, around climate adaptation and what are some of the interventions then that we might be able to test through this model um, before we actually invest in in potentially um, creating big infrastructure infrastructure projects we can actually run some of these scenarios through these models to have an idea of what would be the impact of potential interventions the next project we're going to look at is about social housing so this project was looking at doing a social housing, there is client survey of people who use social housing in London. And so this team was building and working with the city on, on assessing a survey that they already have in place, as well as making some recommendations on how they might improve their survey to be able to gather more information about clients of social housing to better understand um, what is their need, uh, what, what kind of conditions have, have they been living in up until now? What do they do when they don't have access to social housing? How long do they traditionally or usually wait for social housing? What do they do in the meantime? And so London, obviously, this is an issue is that, that London's really focused on right now. And um, we need to have good data to be able to understand what are what is the client base need. Women's safety in parks and paths. So this is another project put forward by the Parks Department that was trying to understand um, how do women use the parks and paths and how do we continue to, to create um, safe and uh, accommodating environments in parks and paths for all, of, all London residents. So this project, um, there's a report here that you can look through and um, these students focused on doing a number of working groups with or some focus groups rather with different um, organizations. They met with the London Environmental Network um, and a number of different organizations to try to gather a bunch of information on parks and to make some recommendations for, for the city. The next project is also about parks. And this was a project that was looking at um, post-construction surveys. So we don't have the students work back yet, but when it comes in, we will add it here. But this project, you'll be able to find out more in the coming weeks, uh, was looking at when, when projects are done in the parks and paths, um, we want to find out whether or not those projects were successful at meeting what the community's desire was for, for the initial intervention of the project. So the, the students designed a survey to be able to um, to, to communicate with residents in the area of the park or the park path construction project that had happened to find out whether or not the project was a success or if there were any 
uh, any useful feedback that we could capture about that that would inform potentially other projects, other parks projects, um, or adjustments that might need to be made. Uh, another project that we're waiting on the, the results back from the students for this um, implementing UN SDG, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal number 11, Safe Cities for Women and Girls. And uh, this project was partnered with um, ANOVA, a community partner, around a report that they have written for the, for the city council. Um, and the, the aim of these students was really to understand what are some best practices from other cities, especially across Canada, who have been implementing um, this United Nations Sustainable Development Goal around creating safe city for women and girls, and what potentially could we learn from those other cities that we could implement here in London. And the last project that I will show you today is about scaling the city studio model in London around uh, matching courses and projects. And so we had a team of um, graduate students who were working on this project. And you can look at their report here and find out more about what they were doing. And here's a little video. Um, they were really looking at optimizing the matching process. This year in our first pilot launch year, we have 21 um, campus course matches and we're trying to optimize our procedure and processes so that we can scale to be able to deliver more matches across the city. And these students were working on creating an, an online application as well as uh, a tool for um, analyzing the data that we got back through the application to be able to match um, a, a larger number of projects to courses as well as match in a way that is that is most likely to deliver the desired uh, output that we're that we're matching that we're looking for. So here's a little short video about that. Today's event is to get ready for year two. So uh, we're in March right now, getting ready for the September 2020 and January 2021 semesters. So starting to harvest those ideas uh, out of city staff, so then we can take them back to the faculty and start to find those matches. So really unique, we uh, actually have a city studio class going on right now with a group of students who are helping us improve this intake process. So those students are running some surveys, they're using their computers, uh, sitting down with both faculty and city staff and walking them through how to properly scope their challenge, uh, how to tie it to the strategic plan, how to identify what would be a good match. So we're using some keywords, some terms, uh, some different things that will plug into an algorithm and will help us with those matchings later on. The event today is both city staff and faculty coming in to either learn more about City Studio or to actually propose their projects and submit those surveys so that we can start matching them with the best projects or courses so that they can get rolling for the fall semester. I think what would make the event successful is just having a big turnout, everyone putting all of their projects um, into the, filling out the survey and putting all their projects in and basically just getting that collaboration between um, the city and the faculty and as well as City Studio. We hope that you'll consider applying to participate in City Studio. The application is online and the application itself will guide you through all the relevant information that we need from you, information about your project or your course, um, and it will look at potentially what the optimal deliverables are for your project, if you're looking at design, mapping, research, and then it will also ask you to identify some potential keywords that might relate to your research, which are directly pulled from the London Strategic Plan. And again, the application will guide you through that process. Please keep an eye on the application deadline online and fill out your application. There's also a section to ask any questions that you might have. Thanks very much and look forward to collaborating with you soon. So on the website here, up in the events tab, you can see here we have the application. So there's a city staff application, a faculty application. If you're applying from uh, Western's main campus, if you're a faculty from Western main campus, you'll need to also fill out this, this um, application. And also you can find, we've started to post the projects for next year that we've harvested so far. So you can also find a list of proposed projects for next year. So you can see, see, these are some of the projects that have been submitted so far from city staff for next year that will be matching with um, with courses on across all five campuses. So we have child-friendly public spaces. Um, we have growing London City Studio again, we're working on that. Um, environmental impact of construction materials, a business plan for underutilized heritage assets, gamification tools for environmental education, all different projects. So there's about 20 or so that are listed there so far that you can 
go and check out. And the, the um, deadline for that application is April 24th. If you have any questions, um, you can also reach out to us. Our contact information is at the bottom of the City Studio webpage. So you can, find, you can reach out if you have questions about that. And, and um, the last thing I wanted to mention before we go back to see how Emma's interpreted all that, all that she's heard is uh, at the top right hand corner of the website here, you see the participant survey. Um, and that takes you out to, we're looking to get feedback from students, um, faculty, and city staff that participated in City Studio. And it's about a five minute survey that you can take. Um, this really helps us secure additional funding to be able to continue to run City Studio in London, as well as to receive your feedback and learn from what we can improve to make City Studio experience even better in London and you'll be entered, you have the opportunity of entering into a draw to win 50 downtown dollars for participating in the survey. Um, and those downtown dollars are really, um, you can spend them sort of like gift certificates across downtown businesses, pretty much all the downtown businesses are participate in that. So I hope that you'll consider taking that survey. And the deadline again is April 24th, also for the survey and for the application. So keep April 24th in your mind. So that was all that I had to share from the website. And um, I'll just check back in now with Emma to see what she's kind of been able to hear from us. So the city studio hubbub, some themes that came up just from the intro of that event were the relationship aspect, the idea of building bridges and learning with action. So that hands-on piece. So the first project we talked about was this open data portal and the online survey that people were taking before April 4th. Then we talked about the waste bylaw violations and one question that came up was who's in the neighborhood and how can we reduce that? So there's an idea of a free store to reduce waste, especially towards the end of the school year, which is now on pause until the fall. Uh, then there was the project on NIMBYism. And one theme I heard come up was the opportunity for London to really be a leader, as well as uh, the idea of a rural inclusive transit plan and whether or not that includes light rail was left, uh, left up in the air a little bit, or there might be more information about that in the full project online. And we talked about the diversity and inclusion strategy and some of the forgotten history of London and the importance of interdisciplinary learning and uh, the idea of promotion as well as impact in the specific identified priority areas. And then we had Mayor Ed Holder hop on the call and he spoke about the question, where do we go from here? We have these projects and some work done and the idea that continued dialogue in an event like Hubbub as well as beyond that and follow up action items are what really move us forward and this idea of resiliency planning came up in kind of the really broad sense of how we are as a city and our institutions and moving forward from this place. And then we talked about the recycling in parks project, the idea that keeping it simple is the best way to get people to uh, take up uh, recycling. So having a single stream bin for all recyclables was their proposed idea, as well as a separate bin for dog waste to help keep that issue at bay. Mm -hmm. And there was the healthy literacy uh, co-op program idea that would involve high school and university students and hopefully scale up to involve the health unit. And then we talked about and continued in today the uh, Goodwill Neighborhood Plan. So revitalizing that uh, intersection at Horton and Wellington using CAD visualizations and making sure that there's lots of green space and housing options and connection to the transit plans. The anti-discrimination toolkit project and the website that uh, you can click through to to find out more information via the Hubba site. And uh, the idea of there being interventions and walks for all of these different isms and things for people to uh, consider and take action on. Then we had the workplace diversity, diversity and inclusion plan. Uh, it was part of a disability studies course and the question of what makes an effective policy came up and one theme that I heard was more action and specific action items uh, that people can take. Then moving on to the resiliency strategy, there was talk about 
urban flooding and wind effects in the city, doing different modeling to help account for some of the climate change that cities and uh, the entire world really um, are experiencing right now. Then moving up to the social housing client survey, some questions around wait times and who's participating and how um, ultimately how can they be served better. Then we had the women's safety on paths and parks, some focus groups that took place and a list of recommendations that were made as a result from those. Uh, still waiting on some more information from the Parks and Paths Impact Survey Project, as well as the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals Safe Cities for Women's and Girls one. So stay tuned for more information on those. And then moving on to the last one, we talked about the City Studio online matching uh, software, being the collaboration of city staff and faculty from the institutions creating matches for the courses based on some deliverables and keywords and uh, key questions that will hopefully help to scale up the program for the future and make some really fantastic matches. And uh, just a reminder to apply for um, projects by April 24th. Just sort of as we're wrapping up, um, it's kind of a strange time that this is the, the end of our first year of City Studio. And um, unfortunately, we're not able to celebrate in person. And in this instance as well, we kind of had to reduce our group down to two people for our sort of final farewell of the year. Um, but I just wanted to take the time to really thank everybody who participated this year, all of the students, all the city staff, all the faculty, all the volunteers, um, all of the working group and advisory group. We have a lot of support from all the partnering institutions that have made this possible. Um, and, and we're really excited about what's to come for London and for City Studio in the coming years. And so thanks again for everybody who has participated and we look forward to, to collaborating with you soon. Take care. <laughs>